in Delhi. Um, you can see it's called Body in South Asian Art and Thought, and I think this Naman's talk today will be taking us right back into the history of the subcontinent. And I, um, I was very disappointed for family reasons. I couldn't go and see the exhibition which Naman organised recently in Brussels. It was a huge critical and, um, and success in terms of numbers, a, a very vast and ambitious exhibition about the body arranged in a very unusual manner. And I was inspired because I heard Naman talk about this at the Belgian Embassy in London. And today we were going to do an in conversation, but I said to him that I thought the talk and the presentation and the material was so wonderful that rather than hearing him drone on, you would much rather today be treated to Naman's talk. Um, I'm also, of course, slightly wary of talking too much in front of Naman because many years ago when I used to teach the first year undergraduate course at the university, I used to take the students to the British Museum because many of our students, especially those who came from less traditional backgrounds, who often came from quite orthodox families um, in the north of England, particularly of Pakistani origin, had never been to a museum. And they all said, oh, do we have to go to a boring museum? And I'd say, no, I thought, yes, you do, and I'm going to take the register, and if you don't come, there'll be trouble. And they used to come, and none of them used to talk, and they used to say, I love the course, you know, now we've heard him talk, we're going to go to all the museums. And I said, well, my actions weren't that bad, that is the word they said. A little bit of professional jealousy, because I know now in presentation today will be in his usual wonderful style. So please welcome him here to the hall today. Thank you all very much for being here. It's quite lovely to be able to come back home. I, um, it was a rare privilege that um, I was asked to put this exhibition together, and it wasn't a very easy exercise because one fought with bureaucracy. If you think Pakistan, we just finished a session in this room about the state and its pernicious nature. And I thought that um, if you think you guys got a tough look across the border, it's, a, it's an as bad or not worse. And, um, and then this was an exhibition that was being held at Brussels, which is the headquarters of the world's bureaucracy. And if you think India and Pakistan are bad, well, then you've got to go and check out Brussels. Uh, and so I don't think, I think we keep contemplating the nature of the state and, its, uh, and the bureaucratic red tape that we all must go through. And this was a project that navigated its way through many hurdles and obstacles to be able to uh, bring together 340 plus objects from 56 museums, archaeological institutes and private collections. And the book, actually, which accompanies the exhibition, which is the reason why I'm here, um, brought together many more than that. It centers around the very complex understanding of the subject of the body, which is such a fundamental subject for anyone who's approaching the subject of art. But it's also a very tangible and a very interesting way to be able to approach philosophy, the history of religion, and the history of civilization itself. Because through the agency of the body, or through thinking about what drives the body, what motivates the body, rather than the physical corporeal body, which is not the subject of my book or my, or my exhibition. Um, it was really to try and figure out what is it that inspires and motivates bodies. And for this, one was able to access fantastic art collections. Um, paintings that had never been seen before from the Rambur Raza Library, manuscripts that have been painted for Akbar to the treasuries of the Madras Museum which has three massive storerooms of Chola bronzes alone. One of Vaishnav bronzes, the other of Shaivite bronzes and a third of goddess related bronzes. And it's, it's, it's um, by the time one opened one strong room after another across the country to be able to access material for this exhibition, it was an enormously humbling exercise to be able to pull together these materials which have never been published or seen into a narrative of South Asia. As I was saying, um, the exhibition really deals with how does a civilization express its thoughts, 
on issues like death and rapture? Is one's place in the cosmos fated by destiny? Or does a body have its own agency? How are the values of men constructed differently from those of women? Now these questions were considered in this book and exhibition through multifaceted understandings ranging from representations of heroic, yogic, ascetic, seductive and dangerous bodies in a display of the richness of Indian art and thought. The body and its representation is revealed not as the subject of art, but as the keeper of the values, preoccupations and aspirations of times ancient, medieval, modern, popular as well as classical ideas. How do you put South Asia in a book? And the entire history of the plural and divergent ways of thinking about these issues into a single book. Which, which South Asia? Who's South Asia? Which constituency is South Asia? You know, you walk into the exhibition and people say, well, there's not enough Maharashtra in this exhibition. We haven't been adequately represented. The Oriyas walk into the exhibition and they say, well, I haven't done justice to them. I haven't done enough South India. But which South India? I mean, do I have to represent the Shaivites of the Chola period? Do I represent the Vaishnavas of the 16th century? Do I represent the Buddhists of South India from the 4th century? Which, which, which India? Which period? Which moment are we going to select or privilege? And if you aren't going to privilege anyone, then your book is going to be encyclopedic. And at some point, I have to wield a red pen and be very sort of be harsh to be able to select specific stories which are sometimes slightly disturbing. Things that I hadn't been told in my own history. Issues and the type of evidence that one was seeing that was slightly uncomfortable sometimes because it made one think about oneself in ways that one hadn't been programmed into thinking. A complex plurality of India emerges which shows a diversity in geography, chronology, patronage, religion, and art and material which are present in every gallery of the exhibition. The variety of South Asian systems of thought present different and sometimes divergent, as I was saying, ways of thinking about the body. The eight themes which I focus on take us not so much into the corporeal or the physical body, but into what, is, into what is inherent within the body, what motivates it, what drives it. And for that, we begin with the first and biggest cliche of all, which is death. Because we're all governed by the idea that the body has an end. So let's begin with the end, uh, as it were. It's also because it's the great cliche of Indian civilization. Everyone is waiting for you know, was expecting that the book and the exhibition would end with the idea of karma or the idea of rebirth, that the body is only transitory and impermanent. And I thought rather than keep this at the end of the exhibition, let's get rid of the cliche right at the beginning of the exhibition. And so the very first chapter was to try and rid ourselves of this baggage and move ahead. Or rather probe and interrogate that cliche further. Well, the ancient Indian concept of the circle of rebirth or samsara believes that the body is impermanent. Death is not always thought of as an ending, but as a passage or a stage of life for the eternal Atma. Now this self that inheres within the body lives on beyond its outer shell. It directs the way in which the body is regarded both in life and treated in death. Art is intimately linked with memory, allowing persons to live on even when they are no longer present in their bodily form. We tend to remember them through portraits, for instance. Now this prompts one to ask questions about how India deals with corporeal remains like relics. Now if the body is meant to be only a temporary vessel, then why does a civilization value and worship relics? because you're believing that the person has been reborn, yet stupas are built over the ashes of the Buddha all over the subcontinent. Why? How does Buddhism itself answer the question about why there should be relic worship at all when the Buddha himself had declared his impermanence? So how do you negotiate the duality of discourse when material culture and evidence says one thing and the textual information that we get from history and from religious texts gives us a very different perspective. 
How do you find that balance between the two worlds of text and practice? Another question is, how do you deal with ancestors' memories and spirits? Now, in this gallery, which you can see, uh, 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 can we put these lights on? Yeah. Yeah. Because the slides are really fantastic and you'll be able to see them well. Yeah. Thank you. So in this, what we see is a large expanse of memorials for ordinary people. I decided in this uh, book and exhibition that I wasn't going to focus only on an elite art tradition of, or religious art only from myths, but also try and bring in the life of the everyday into this exhibition. And in order to do that, I tried in every room to start with the life of the every man. And uh, and of course, every woman as well in the exhibition. Good. A portrait that must be familiar to most people who are interested in South Asian art. Um, you must have seen this many times before. It's a portrait made by. Um, ooh, names escaping me. <laughs> uh, made by Balchand. Um, the painter Balchand made this painting of Inayat Khan. <coughs> Inayat Khan was a close confidant of the Emperor Jahangir. And in his last few days, seeing Inayat Khan's body completely wasted and dying, Jahangir had this very peculiar obsessive desire to have his friend documented. And paintings were made and sketches were made of, of Inayat Khan's dying breath. Inayat Khan was dying because of alcoholism and his communicate a subject of the colourful world that once surrounded a man that is now wasting away and dying in the middle of that painting. Um, what do we do? We can't really do this with us, right? It's coming. Because the joy of the picture is oh, it's coming. <laughs> I'll carry on in the meantime. Another way of thinking about death, as I was saying, was the entire basis of Buddhist art begins because of the cult of the stupa. And every stupa is basically a funerary monument. It contains ashes or relics within it. Amongst the earliest depictions that we have of how stupas were worshipped is this relief that comes from the stupa of Harund in Madhya Pradesh from the 2nd century BC, which shows a woman who has just finished praying at the site of the stupa, leaving her palm prints behind on the stupa as she leaves the scene. Some of the oldest depictions that come from Gandhara actually make much of the Buddha's last moments. He is shown, being, he is shown first in a coffin, and the coffin is then taken to a funeral pyre. And after he is cremated, his ashes were kept in, um, separated and kept as relics that were divided amongst different parts of South Asia. Another way of thinking about death, if you think, if those of you are familiar with world art, must have seen paintings of what is of Hieronymus Bosch and the uh, views of hell. There's a genre of paintings called the Karni Bharnis. Um, Jaisa Karni, Vaisa Bharni, as you would understand the meaning. And in, this is a set of Jain paintings. Um, they became very popular in the Jain tradition from the 14th century onwards. And a large number of these paintings have been are scattered in all over South Asia. Um, this is a group of seven which shows rather graphic views of what can happen in hell. Um, the Jains developed a very complex system of multiple hells and various heavens that you would be sent to depending on your actions, on your karma. And um, they, get, they can get quite exciting, some of these paintings. They can um, really detail the kind of monsters you will meet in the burning fires of hell. But what's exciting even more so is that the reverse of each of these paintings are about birth and creation. And in as much as the one side of the painting has been painted with very graphic representations of bodies, 
The other side completely abstains from physical representation and purely in abstract terms communicates birth or creation. And the simultaneity of wanting to live in a world which both abstains from physical bodily representation and at the same time uh, embraces abstraction and at the same time revels in bodily depiction. Uh, both things are being seen simultaneously in the culture. Um, and it's this simultaneity which is rather interesting for us to note. These are paintings from the reverse of those which show creation, as I was saying. Amongst the Kadi Bharni paintings, perhaps the most beautiful ones that I was able to find were a group of three sketches made by a Pahari master which had been languishing in the Sadarjan Museum in Hyderabad. And out of their reserve collection, one found some of these made with such a deft hand for anyone who is an experienced draftsman would know that the fluidity and sophistication and control of this artist over his line drawing is such there was no desire at all, there was no need to finish this as a painting but to leave it complete um, as, a, as a sketch. There are three such sketches which I'll show you which, just, which show the vicissitudes of hell. Uh, each one, this one shows uh, spikes and spears being driven through bodies and that's the full picture. Um, with birds coming in to peck at the bodies. Um, another one shows dogs eating those bodies. <coughs> and it becomes animated in this case. And the third one, which is absolutely lyrical, which shows the people drowning in the waters of hell, in the hot bubbling fluids of hell. And it shows these bodies actually submerging. Um, so it's a, a very nice sort of set of drawings that actually encapsulates um, uh, what happens. So coming back to the everyman, the exhibition and book begins with stories of how people have been commemorated. Right in front we have a Naga Northeastern warrior who has been memorialized. Behind it we have a Sati stone from the 13th century, 13th to 14th centuries, from the borders between Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh. Most people seem to think that sati was a practice that happened only in the northern part of South Asia, and that's not actually true. The practice was widespread. Um, and here we have, from Madhya Pradesh, central India, um, a depiction of a Rajput uh, uh, myth of Padhuji, uh, which has been where it shows memorials to our ancestors being commemorated over there. In the um, in the background behind this memorial stone, we see uh, a memorial made for a warrior from the region of Mandi or Kulu, um, who has been remembered as somebody who will go into a land where he will, because he's been martyred in war. Note. <laughs> The martyr sits in the center of the commemorative plaque, surrounded by women on all sides as he reaches a heaven, which is a temple where there are uh, beautiful apsaras and paris waiting for him for having fought uh, a valiant war. Uh, but we don't know that about certain religious practices. We only think it happens in some parts of the world and not in other parts of the world. <laughs> and we tend to forget some of these ideas of how endemic and widespread they are. Um, a man who, uh, in fact, this practice of sati, this, is, this was a page which had been lying in the National Museum as being wrongly identified, had been wrongly identified. It's a diary that was an illustrated diary left by a Persian traveler an Iranian traveler who was going through Rajasthan and he saw a Johar uh, when there is a mass sati, when many women commit uh, sati together and he witnessed this and he was so shocked at what he saw that he, he had it painted, he had the scene painted and so these blazing fires are something that he commemorated in his annals. Um, but coming back to the subject of martyrdom, very topical subject but people don't tend to realize that from the, about the 9th through to about the 14th centuries, 
there were an innumerable amount of Indian sculptures that were made that commemorated martyrs of different religions. And extraordinary amongst them are these ones from Varangal, um, uh, around the region of Varangal in southern Andhra Pradesh, where you get a man very graphically disemboweling himself, his body split into two. Now, when these martyrs would fall in war, it was never that he had been vanquished. He would be remembered by his community as always somebody who had sacrificed himself for the sake of the community. And so you see them always in a pose of committing harakiri in some way, and you see him driving that knife through himself and his intestines spilling out of his body. Now on the other side, what's even less known is that women seem to be commemorated only when they commit sati. And that's not actually true because you have female soldiers that are commemorated as well. And that's a memorial that's been made for a, a female warrior. But like the boy, even when she gets to heaven, she has apsaras waiting for her. Um, and there are no valiant men waiting for her when she reaches heaven. So the patriarchy does kick in eventually. It doesn't, it doesn't so much for having a, a female soldier, everyone thought, you know, how exciting, but then the poor girl gets up there and it's the same lot <laughs> for her. Um, one of the more um, ravishing and exciting discoveries was this particular sculpture of Shiv in his form as Bhairav, who roams the charnel grounds and he is beside a cremation pyre which is burning. He carries the corpse on his shoulders and his skin is just about falling off his body. Um, we never knew about, apart from that extraordinary sculpture in the Lahore Museum of the Emaciated Buddha meditating, um, we didn't know that there was any attempt at verisimilitude or making graphic, accurate, anatomical representations of anything in South Asian art. And it seems that again in the Tantric monastery centers, from about the 9th century through to about the 12th, there was this great desire to make skeletal bodies in tantric practice. And that spread from these Hindu tantric mutts um, into Tibetan and Nepalese ones, where it was picked up and it became a mainstay in Buddhist uh, Vajrayana iconographic forms, where they began to be represented in, where they had a whole iconographic system of skeletal bodies. Um, amongst um, the more beautiful representations of death was this particular painting made for the Emperor Akbar in his personal copy of the Ramayana, which shows the cremation of Dashrat. And if you look carefully enough in the blazing fire, you'll see the outline of a man who is being cremated. Um, I'll come to other examples of Akhari paintings where death has been memorialized and there are other such depictions. But before I proceed, I think one of the great artistic masterpieces, again for those of you who are practicing artists will see this immediately. It's a painting from the Ramayana made by a Pahari master that shows the death of Dashrath. The painting has been composed with a series of very sharp diagonals and been rendered in a state of white, which is a color of mourning. In the middle of the painting is a courtyard, which has been given such a pride of place. But the courtyard of a house, which is the hub of all activity, is now empty. And that one lonesome Shatrugan figure is seen in all the corners of the painting as he weeps in a continuous narrative. He's told of the news of the death of his father. He enters the house, he sees his servants and others weeping. He goes quietly to a corner to cry. He carries on further, gets the blessings of his mother to be able to go and see the dead corpse of his father. A lot of activity, but all at the periphery because the heart of the house, the heart of the house, is now empty. And the artist is not just a mindless copyist who is being told to make a story but he's investing the story with agency of his own. And I think if we don't start recognizing our master painters of the past, 
in this way as being creative thinking men and women who painted rather than just mechanical copyists. We'll never give art history a chance to really as a discipline. <laughs> Akbar's fascination with different systems of thought um, famously took him to collect large numbers of Christian paintings and particularly lithographs, etchings, sorry, that were coming in to him from um, by the Jesuits and the Flemish books that were coming to him. One that he had copied was this particular one that had, which where this is made in the period of Jahangir, but it's based on a picture that is from the period of Akbar, um, that was obviously brought to the Mughal court and showed the descent from the cross. Okay, now, I have eight such chapters to talk about, and I don't know how I'm going to get through them. <laughs> My second chapter deals with the idea of those systems in world art and in world religion that are opposed to the representation of the body. How do we talk about the body in art when the body is not permitted to be made in art? Now, it would be silly on my part to have to introduce an audience in Lahore to Islam's proscriptions on the making of the body. But what would be interesting to talk about, on the other hand, would be other religions' proscriptions which are also there on the representation of the body and why those exist. And just as, just as there has been a proscription in Islam, there has been a long-standing ban against or just not ban, never a ban, but a resistance in many traditions to, to the representation of the body. So when the body is not being represented, what do you represent those ideas with instead of making the body? How else can you represent the ideas that you would normally have communicated through the body? What would you use to substitute it? And we're very familiar with the world of pattern, with the world of decorative ornament as substituting the world of physical bodily language. But what else could we possibly use? What other substitutes might there be? Well, this particular paint, uh, little sculpture is very exciting. It's made by a community in, in central to southern India. That means that the world, the frame is alive, but the inside is absolutely empty. The inside can be filled with any, any light that pervades it. This idea was really picked up a lot by the Jains as well, where they made a series of pictures of the absent body, the non-being. It was it's popularly called the Akash Purush, but its correct name is actually the Siddha Pratima Yantra. And these figures, we always thought were 18th or 19th century, but it now turns out that the Freer and Sackler Gallery in Washington, D.C. has a dated piece from 1333. So, it's obviously a very ancient idea. As I was saying, people have this assumption that if you're dealing with Indian art from antiquity, you'll be showing in an, in an, in an exhibition in Europe, which is titled The Body in Indian Art, I'll be showing lots of examples of Indian sculptures and lots of bodies. And that's exactly the cliché that had to be demolished. Because it's exactly the cliché that the West would expect. And there would be, but there is a counter narrative. There is a counter narrative of resistance to the representation of the body, which is as important. And so that's what this chapter and this gallery really gets down to exploring. So, for instance, um, oops, probably. the gallery was designed with a wall where all the people walking into the gallery we only had their shadows um, projected as they were coming in. We're dealing with the absent body. What do we look at instead? Well, we have a massive grave stone there of a mobile princess that was found lying on the slope. I found it in the Red Fort in Delhi. We haven't been, it was one of the things that was ransacked uh, during the revolt of 1857. And um, we don't know whose gravestone it is because it just has the Ayat Kursi written on it and it doesn't actually identify who the person is. So, um, it's... But the gallery um, began with some very ancient representations. 
Contemporaneous with the late part of the Indus Valley civilization was another group of, we found a group of copper hoard objects from the region of Hardoi, Kanpur, Shahabad, uh, in the Ganga Valley. These are called the calculated copper hoard objects, and they are always shaped in these anthropomorphic forms, but never literally physical bodies. And it's always been assumed that that reason was that this was supposed to be allegedly, quote unquote, the Vedic age. And the Vedic texts never make any allowance for image worship. There is no image worship that is sanctioned in the Vedas. The Vedas are basically texts which are about sacrifices. So, um, when looking at these kinds of objects, people always assume that it was because um, it is at that time when there is a general iconoclastic belief system and there are no images to be made, except there is this recent discovery um, from Muradabad uh, where we found that, oops, sorry, that object which had a head of a ball and it has an Indus Valley type of bull made across his chest. And I'm very sorry, the slide isn't clear here, but there is a three-line Brahmi inscription about it, which hasn't yet been deciphered or read. But it shows a fantastic overlap between the civilizations when the earliest scripts of South Asia were developing and the last vestiges of the Indus Valley civilization are still there. And perhaps we might eventually be able to bridge that gap between what happened in the, in the Indus Valley period and the rise of the states in the 6th century BC through the discovery of objects like this. Now people assume that Vedic culture was completely opposed to image worship. What people haven't really explored till the mid-1970s were by, there was a very famous American Sanskrit scholar by the name of Fritz Stahl who re-performed certain very rare Vedic ceremonies called the Agni Chayana ritual. And that he discovered during the performance of this one year ritual that they would make these ancient brick altars on which the rituals would be performed where six pairs of Mahavir pots. Now the word Mahavir is a word that you and I would associate with the Jains. But the word Mahavir, just great man, great hero, is a much older word which is found in Vedic texts and is a word which simply means which was the Mahavir was a pot which contained the spirit of the man. And these pots, like the ones that you see here, were filled with these spirits and they were broken on the altar when the ritual would take place. And these pots do suggest some kind of anthropomorphism, as you can see, there is something physical and bodily about them. So I'm not so sure that we can talk about the fact that there was no physical representation at that time. Um, in many cultures, we also find that the tree substitutes the depiction of the body. And so the gallery was composed with a large tree in the center. And that takes us to a much older system, again from Bharat, where we see a representation of a Buddha, because there were many Buddhas. Um, Kashyapa Buddha, who is one of the Manushi Buddhas, depicted in this case as a tree being garlanded, but not actually physically shown. Again, early Buddhists did not permit or did not favor the representation of the sculpture or the image of the Buddha. And it was only after the second century AD that images of the Buddha began to be made in Buddhist art. Um, until then, um, there was a, a, a resistance to the representation of the physical body of the Buddha. And he was substituted often instead with things like trees. Now, coming into um, a different context. Very curiously, when we look at an alam, for instance, and how close does an alam come to bodily representation? Well, apart from the fact that he, it is veritably the focus of attention um, all through the month of Muharram, and then on the last day, it is immersed in a tank of water for it to be cooled. Rather, like the way images are taken and then immersed in the waters to be cooled at the end of the whole month of celebration or two weeks or ten days of celebration around it. The other also often has a symbol atop it, which is in the shape oops, of a palm, which you can see up there. 
and um, these are from Lucknow, and this central one is from Hyderabad. Um, in this one, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm pressing all the wrong buttons. <coughs> and this one actually has um, uh, has an Imam Bara or an Ashur Khan that is actually made represented in the center of it. Um, <coughs> and there is an old. Uh, watercolor that actually shows Tazias being taken out in a very gentle and lovely procession of a kind that we no longer see uh, those kinds of processions and this one's from Mushinaba. Now this business of representing the Panjatan, the five bodies, is in itself such an interesting name um, to be able to think about. Um, um, in early Buddhist start, and even though the images of the Buddha began to be made after the 2nd century, there were many within Buddhism who resisted the representation of the Buddha. And so here we have a much later footprint of the 9th century, but a conceptual footprint because it's that big. It's a mythical footprint, like the way you have one at the Lahore Museum as well, a large one from Gandhara, which shows him through the idea of just a, a, a gigantic footprint. So this one comes from Bodh Gaya and Bihar. But the idea of the footprint representing the master of the Guru is one which is there in, in many traditions. After all, we have the whole tradition of the Kadam Rasul. And um, you have several of these footprints. Now, these particular pieces were from a mosque in Darya Ganj in Delhi that was looted at the, in 1857. And all of this stuff that came out of Delhi is was now lying in the some of it is still lying in the new Red Fort Museum in in Delhi. And so we were able to access the storerooms. And behind one of them, there is an inscription written by a man in a very Victorian handwriting. Uh, a Captain Mortimer, 63rd Rifles, September 1857, who says that allegedly a footprint of the Prophet Muhammad dug up from a mosque near Darya, in Darya Ganj um, and he, he, he deposited it, he gave it to the local authorities at that time. Now, this idea of footprints, of course, um, spreads further um, and is endemic, of course, in, in world art and you would get the idea in, in Hindu belief systems as well Yes, they chop in the picture from the 18th century of the feet of Vishnu. Or, um, I'll show you some others in a little while. Now, if you don't represent the body, you can use talismans or the calligraphic word, as we all know, can become a substitute for the body. But an interesting example is to think about these talismanic shirts, which, have, which allow you to be protected by the Quran, as it were, because your whole body is covered by those verses. <clears throat> Perhaps the most exciting for me <laughs> was the discovery of this particular ritual in Kerala. There are some temples in Kerala where there isn't an image inside the Garbhagri, inside the sanctum of the temple. There is no sculpture. You don't go in there for darshan with a god. You go through a really busy temple and when you come right into the heart of a temple, there is a mirror. And you have a witness of yourself. You look into your own eyes and self-realization is the ultimate god. So the mirror is enshrined as a god in the temple. And it again makes for a very valuable substitute. So here, the mirror is being treated like a veritable god. And there is an entire ceremony taking place and it's being ritually bathed and cleaned and all the rest of it and it's going to be taken back into the sanctum of the temple where it will be reinstated. Now some of these mirrors um, are almost humanoid in the form that they take. And very rarely, and I'm sorry the angle of this photograph doesn't permit you to see it, but sometimes they can even be carved very charmingly, a pair of little footprints at the base of the mirror. So the mirror is almost like a living thing.
from the Maharaja of Jodhpur's collection came a group of paintings that I was able to borrow about moving from formlessness to nothingness, from form to nothingness. The world of men on earth, you meditate and you reach a state of the world of gods in the heavens. Ultimately, there is nothing but the Peer or the Guru in a golden world. And finally, there is not even him, but there is a state of nothingness. Now this idea of abstraction and this need to represent and paint nothingness, we never thought it really happened to such an extent in South Asian art. But actually, in uh, 18th and 19th century art, there is a huge amount of it. Way before conceptual movements in the 1960s, there was a lot of depiction of, of the idea of nothingness and how do you represent nothingness in art. Now the next gallery, the next subject takes me from nothingness to something. And how you can be, how do you come into awareness, how do you come into being, how do you come to be born. And that's why this takes us from a state of a picture that ended on the notion of nothingness and this actually begins with the notion of nothingness to a state of duality, to a state of cognition, to a state of relativity because all knowledge systems are in relation to each other and all knowledge is, is not in a condition of being an absolute knowledge but is in relation to another form of knowledge and that's why you have that duality. Now, um, the stories of the creation of the universe and the gods are inseparable, are inseparable from the creation myths of the first human bodies. The dreams of mortals, their desires and imaginings gave birth to gods. But conversely, through the tales of gods, we see that gods made men. Concepts of cyclical time and the idea that a person is subject to rebirth are fundamental to many Indian, early Indian religious systems. But even the concept of rebirth necessitates that a first birth must have taken place somewhere, sometime. Somebody has got to have been born for rebirth to take place, otherwise who's getting rebirth? Or how is rebirth, how is rebirth happening? So what brought about that first birth? The myths and philosophies of ancient India reveal that the birth of man cannot be separated from the beginnings of desire, from the birth of an idea, nor from the spark of creative inertia. And so what we see over here, for instance, for those who believe that the word or sound is where the creation comes from, in Vedic myths, there is a depiction of a personification of a particular goddess of sound, who is called Vag Devi or Vat Devi, and here she is with her mouth open, uttering that there is utterance, articulation, and that leads to creation. In the beginning, in some other stories, you are told that there was nothing but a seed, a golden seed that wished to be. It had the desire to reproduce, and so. Here we have a painting of that idea of the golden seed. It's an idea that takes us to contemporary representations as well. Because in the middle of the show, I had this giant egg, which was made by Subodh Gupta, which was a take off, take off on the same idea of that golden seed of creation that's waiting to explode. Um, I'm going to start skipping forward because otherwise we won't be able to see anything. I've only not even a third, no, about a third of the way through. The creation of the universe is seen as the two absolutes of Purusha and Prakriti in the systems of thought which are called Sankhya. And here we see Purush, the absolute, with the black dot above him, but Prakriti, which is nature, which is manifest, which is the manifest world is seen as an urban landscape of 1780. Um, you know, we have so few depictions of urban landscapes from the 18th century and what they might have looked like, and that's a, a very interesting depiction of one. Um, one of the main stories that are associated with the god Shiv is that after he lost his first wife, Sati, Shiv's first wife's name was Sati, and she took up cudgels on his behalf, because she was very upset that her father didn't really respect 
his son-in-law. And um, so she decided in an act of defiance to immolate herself outside her father's house. At um, which point Shiv was completely ravaged by the fact that his wife had done this and he'd been left bereft. And the loss of his wife left him in a condition that he was, became a, an ascetic, he retired into the mountains, and he was never to be seen and heard of um, for, the, for the universe. He, he'd become dead to the world. <coughs> Meanwhile, havoc was being created on Earth by a particular demon called Tarakasur. And this is, oops, uh, here we are, the close-up of the demon Taraka, who had become this flaming ball of fire um, and everyone was praying to the different gods to try and help them and rescue them and say, we've got to get out of this. And this is the only person who can do this is either Shiv or a child of Shiv. And Shiv isn't interested. He's not bothered in the world. And he's certainly not interested in having a child because he is beyond desire. He has no physical desire. And if there's going to be no desire, there's going to be no equilibrium in the world. And in order to be able to bring equilibrium back in the world, desire has to be rekindled in some way. And the rekindling of desire and bringing desire back is what leads to the rebirth of his wife, who comes back as Parvati, as Uma. Um, and this is one of the few paintings where instead of celebrating the birth of a male child, we have the celebration, we have finally a painting that celebrates the birth of a female child. And so, um, in the far corner over there, oh, I'm sorry, I keep pressing the wrong buttons. The daughter of the Himalayas, Parvat, Parvat, and the daughter of the Parvats, Parvati, is born, and she lies in a little crib over there. And that birth is going to put an end to this menace of the monster that is wreaking havoc. So there. It's just a contrast of the two scenes, um, also painted in the late 18th century from Jodhpur. Birth also leads us to think about issues of um, the mother. And one of the ways of thinking about the mother, um, particularly in ancient Indian art, was through a very powerful set of sculptures that were popular up until the 7th, 8th centuries, which were called the Matrikas. And these matrikas were usually codified into a set of seven mantras, sapta matrikas, but they could be others as well. They could be more than seven in some traditions. Um, we have, in, it was in this room that I looked at a certain kind of tribal belief systems with these fertility rings, some of the work of a contemporary artist called Brinali Mukherjee looking at this fantastically large sculpture um, of um, uh, almost like a female generative organ. Um, and comparing it with uh, an image of a, a, a birthing goddess. Now these images of birthing goddesses were very popular in Swat at a site called Kashmir Smast, where we found a large number of them which have a headless figure where instead of a human head, she has the head of a lotus. And she is seen in the pose of giving birth. And the type is found all the way from Swat through till southern India. Um, and a large number have been found as small little tavises or uh, amulets um, to be worn on the body from about the second century BC through till about the 8th century AD. And after that, this goddess seems to have fallen out of favor and she was never made for worship again. So we still don't know her real name. Art historians have given her this name of Lajja Gauri, but we really don't know what her ancient name was because we've never found an inscribed piece. It's a vanished religious cult. The star of the room was really this particular set, um, which came from the little town of Kannauj in UP, which um, is both, only preserves four out of what was once a set of seven mothers. 
And it has to be amongst the best pieces of sculpture that survives from the early medieval period anywhere. Um, which shows these very graceful mothers, each playing with their children. And the last one, which all of these mothers were the female aspect of certain male deities, except the horrifying Chamunda. The last figure that we see here, who has fangs and whose body is completely emaciated, she is in a condition that is beyond vanity, and there is nothing more powerful than the mother who is there to protect her young. The most powerful, terrifying force on earth will be that of a female who is there to protect her young. And so out of, whereas all the other goddesses might have been born out of a male god, Chamunda is the only one that is born out of the fury and wrath of Durga. Because Durga herself is a very beautiful goddess. She's not considered, even though she is a dynamic, but she's very beautiful. But this is a form where even beauty has been left behind. There is nothing, there is no cause for vanity. She has become a physical ogress because she's a protectress. Um, there is nothing that will come in her way uh, for protecting her young. The last part of this room actually explores the idea of uh, miraculous conceptions, birth stories. And there are parallel birth stories. I mean, if you think about any religion in the world, everyone seems to have had an immaculate conception. Uh, uh, the birth of Jesus is such a well-known story that I won't repeat. So the birth, in the Catholic tradition, the birth of Miriam is not given as much importance as it is in certain Islamic traditions. And the birth of Mary became a very popular story in the Mughal court. And I'm going to show you a painting made from Muhammad Shah and Leela, which shows the birth of Mary. It's in the same way, if you think of the Shah Lama, it is the birth of Rustam, that is a really immaculate conception story. He is also born rather dynamically and in an extraordinary way with a caesarean-like performance that is done and the body is taken up. If you think of the birth of Siddharth, the mother has a dream that an elephant enters her body and then the body baby is born from the side. It's another immaculate conception. If you think of the birth of Shiv and Parvati's children, the Hindu happy family, they're not actually a biological family at all. I mean, Shiv has his child, Kartik, and Parvati has her child, Ganesh, and they live together as a single united family. Um, you have a situation when you think of the Jains and their birth stories, um, where Mahavir is conceived in the womb of a Brahmin woman, and then there is an in vitro transfer of the fetus to the womb of a Kshatriya woman that is performed by a mythical morphed surgeon called Hari Naivamesha, or just Naivamesha, who transfers the embryo from womb to womb, and the baby is born from the baby is born from a from a Kshatriya woman's womb. Or if you think of the birth of Krishna, where he is conceived in one family. But he's given up for adoption, and the entire story about the loving Krishna and the mother's love for the child and Yashoda and Krishna's stories are about the love between an adoptive mother and an adoptive child. And it's not about a biological relationship at all. So, birth stories really, all across, tend to be filled with stories of immaculate conceptions. And that's what this room began to explore. So, for instance, these are the Jain ones, which look at the various paintings, uh, 14th, 15th century paintings of the birth of different Jain Tethankars. And that is a very ancient 2nd century sculpture of Hari Naivamesha. He is a, has a morphed supernatural body, partly animal, partly human, because he belongs partly in one world and partly in another world, and he can take embryos from one world and transfer them. And so little children are seen on his shoulders, um, this is the one which was the nativity of Mary that was painted for Muhammad Shah and Leela at our left. And that's a rather wonderful painting of the birth of Siddharth at our right. Um, that. The birth of Krishna and early representation in continuous narrative. I haven't the time to explain it. Um, to a contemporary artwork which shows the ultimate immaculate conception that's going to happen in the future, which is a pregnant man, made by the contemporary Indian artist Mitch Hussain. Um, and finally we come to 
halfway through, but I think I'd better stop because we really have the time to pursue this because there's far too much. Um, if um, uh, this is one of the great paintings that comes from the collection of the Emperor Akbar, which is from the Tarjama Sir al Makhtoum, that actually shows uh, a, a talisman for a Cancerian man. If a Cancerian man was to see this particular uh, no, so this um, uh, uh, talis uh, this talisman, this cure, um, he would be blessed with good fortune and good health. It shows a body made of light that is effulging out of it. Normally I'd be very cross if somebody ran out of time because I realise the difficulty of this task and also because I was so engrossed that um, I can quite happily sit here for at least another couple of hours to watch more of these images and hear more about them. In, the, in this fabulous catalogue, which unfortunately we don't seem to be able to get hold of, the first 2,000 copies have been sold out. Um, but, but a really incredible connection. And this idea, I think, that's not just about showing us the images and telling us about the images, but realising there's a whole other history from the written history that we know about the history of the way the body seemed thought. And I like the way very much, Norman, that you put together, you know, you didn't divide it saying, you know, this happened here or that happened here or this religion did that. Because you said, although many of them have religious associations, they're also cultural objects and they're ways of thinking about the culture and, you know, ways in which systems of thought have influenced other systems of thought. But also, I mean, I think it's important, you know, we saw just last week in India the banning of Wendy Donegan's book, you know, the way that things from the past make us feel uncomfortable. I mean, there are images here that, you know, you think, gosh, would I put those in a classroom and how would we feel about talking about them? And, you know, they're, they're very powerful images. And I think the power of the image in South Asia is one of those things that we can't get away from, and you know, this is Absolutely, I think, you know, my job is that of a historian, a historian of religious iconography, and what I try and do is try and think laterally, not think about it from the de defining parameters of a religion as we know it now, but I like to think about the 20th century, and what's going on in our times. It's in the same way, when I think of all the parallel influences that are acting upon us, I have to do the same thing when I think of the 6th century or the 7th century. And what of all the things that are happening at that time in the 7th century? And looking at it diachronic, looking at it with that simultaneity of saying, oh yes, 9th, 10th, 11th centuries, crusades, martyrs, images being made in the, of the Knights Templar, images being made of warriors in Warangal, martyrdom happening as something that's being exalted across the world at about the same time, suddenly puts things in a lot of historical perspective, rather than trying to isolate the phenomenon and think about it only from the defining parameters and then end up feeling persecuted. That no, my identity does not permit me to think like that, but I'm not thinking of my identity, I'm thinking about the identity of the guy in the 9th century, in his climate. And there has to be that historical distancing, which is what a juxtaposing of material allows one to do, really. And, and I mean, you know, I mean, this, this catalogue, I, I, you know, I don't know how you manage to deal with bureaucracy. I'm not getting a visa on dinner without <laughs> having to do more than that. But just to put them together, I mean, this unknown mystery, I mean, you know, most of these images that I haven't seen, I think maybe an eye and one of the few images I've seen before, really, that how little we know about this whole history of images and how important it is for us because so much of what we see around us today comes from this. I mean, really, an incredibly rich and rewarding history. I'm not sure we have time for questions. Maybe the best thing to do would be to gather outside. And if those of you who want to ask questions, then now and if you can hold off a desire for a cup of tea for a few minutes at least, perhaps you could do it. But we can thank him at least for his wonderful presentation.